So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And now we start sagen, with our last today's panel. Uh, now we we will speak about well, Russian and Ukrainian memory wars. We did it also thank doing the the panel before, but right now we are doing it more precise with um, a couple of very distinguished speakers. Uh, first. Tina uh, would speak uh, to us. She's a historian from the Hushevsky Institute for Ukrainian Archaeology and saw studies of a National Academy of Science of Ukraine. And her presentation is about, I think, therefore I am, how Ukraine struggled for international recognition and independence from Russia 100 years ago through the means of cultural Diplomacy. So the floor is yours. Maybe I'll use this uh, okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this conference. I'm honored to be here. And also allow me to express my gratitude to the Polish people and to all of you who in this difficult time for Ukraine support our people in the struggle for independence. Unfortunately, uh, Ukrainian civilians die every day from Russian missiles. Russian terrorist attacks have not stopped in Ukrainian cities for more than eight months, and in particular in Kyiv, where I've been since the very beginning of Russian aggression. Even this paper I wrote during the explosion in Kyiv, hearing the whistling of rockets outside the window of my house. Uh, <clears throat> starting from the February 24, this is my first departure from Ukraine, and I consider it my duty to tell you not so much about the events of today, as you see them every day on the news, but about the events of 100 years ago, to show that there is nothing new in the behavior of the Russian terrorist state. 100 years ago, Russia terrorized the Ukrainian people, just as it does today, denying our right to exist. Russia waived a war against the newly proclaimed Ukrainian Democratic Republic and declared to the world that Ukrainians and, uh, and Russians are one nation. So how in those conditions the government of Ukraine sought the support of the Western world and how it fought against the lies of Russian propaganda by the means of cultural diplomacy, in particular through song, is what my speech is about. And to begin in, I want you to listen to exactly that song, particular the melody, through which uh, 100 years ago Ukrainian diplomacy was trying to prove to the world that Ukraine is not Russia. I think you'll be surprised because most of you, I think, will recognize this melody. Let's take a listen to it. <laughs> Okay, I think you recognized the most famous carol, Carol of the Bells, uh, that is heard every year at Christmas in all corners of our planet. In the world, it is uh, considered as American, and as we just heard, it's sung in English. So what can it uh, have to do with Ukraine, and especially with the issues of Ukraine's fight for independence? Before I answer this question, I'd like to note a few methodological uh, issues about my research. This is the first research um, on this topic in historiography, and it is based on my work uh, with the archive of the Ukrainian Rep uh, Democratic Republic Choir, which toured during um, 1994, 1990, 1994, in seven countries of the world, and actually presented this song uh, abroad. Uh, during 100 years, this archive, which is stored in central state archives of supreme bodies of power and government 
of Ukraine in Kyiv now has actually remained outside the attention of scientists. And only a few years ago, the main array of its documents was for the first time introduced into the scientific circulation in two of my books of archival documents that you can see on the screen, and I will show some documents on my presentation today. The main thesis of my research is that Ukrainian culture diplomacy has actually been around for over 100 years. It didn't start in uh, 2050, as it was stated in the Ukrainian diplomatic and academic circles after the Department of Culture Diplomacy was created in the structure of the Ukrainian Mis Ministry of Foreign Affairs that year. In fact, the first governmental project of cultural diplomacy was introduced in Ukraine in 1919, talking uh, about history and memory. And actually, from that time, Ukraine should count down its model of cultural diplomacy of the modern area, especially as it is so much relevant with today's um, event of Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> Since this is the first study in Ukraine of the history of cultural diplomacy, I focused on foreign examples in this field. First of all, on Polish historical studies of cultural diplomacy, and particular on the book Polish Cultural Diplomacy after 1918. It actually inspired me to pose a similar methodological question regarding the Ukrainian model of cultural diplomacy. Research on the history of musical diplomacy of the USA and other uh, countries in the late 19th and early uh, 20th centuries was also significant for me. Uh, and as the experience of Ukrainian Democratic Republic is still not represented in the world historiography of cultural diplomacy, it is important for me to popularize this topic at, as it fully corresponds to the main definition of the concept of cultural diplomacy. And I will mention only a few of them. So cultural diplomacy, uh, the goal of cultural diplomacy is to create a successful self-portrait of country abroad, uh, or cultural diplomacy reveals the soul of a nation, uh, or cultural diplomacy is the policy of promoting the interest of subject through the dissemination of culture, for example, through the organization of an international tour of a prominent musician. Relying in particular on the last definition of this concept, I turn to the presentation of uh, my uh, story. So, um, of course, you know all these facts, but I should remind them from the Ukrainian point of view. Um, as we know, after the fall of the Russian monarchy and the revolution in Russia in 1917, uh, the enslaved nations of the empire began the struggle for self-determination and, and state independence. Finland was the first state who declared its independence in December 1917. The second was Ukraine, Ukrainian Democratic Republic, which declared its independence in January 1918. They were followed by the Baltic countries, the South Caucasus and Poland. However, Russia didn't want to lose its colonies. The Russian Bolsheviks, who seized power in Moscow, started hybrid wars against the newly created states. Under the pretext of liberating Ukraine and the Baltic states from chauvinists, they began the occupation of these lands. At first, they seized Kharkiv, declaring a fake Ukrainian Democratic Republic there, then began a full-scale offensive on Kyiv. Despite the condemnation of Bolshevism, Europe and the USA were in no hurry to provide military support to Ukraine. Also, despite the statements of American President Woodrow Wilson and the leaders of the intent about the right of nations to self-determination, the uh, these leaders didn't recognize Ukrainian independence. The West countries at that time was under the influence of Russian propaganda, which for centuries declared the Ukrainians and Russians are one nation. So in the fight against the Bolshevik, the intent armed white army of Russia, who sought to revive the Russian empire and denied Ukraine's right to independence. One of the leaders of this army, Anton Denikin, today Putin's favorite, declared that Ukrainians as a separate people do not exist that they are only the, quoting, little Russian branch of the United Russian nation, and Kyiv is the mother of Russian cities. So both Russian, red and white, started war against Ukraine's independence. How could Ukrainians escape from these brotherly embraces? How could they prove to the West that Ukrainians are not Russians, and that Ukrainians like the Poles or Finns have the right to state independence? This is where the song, Enter the arena of Ukrainian diplomacy.
It is necessary to open Ukraine to the world through culture, decided Ukrainian commander-in-chief and head of the director of Ukrainian Democratic uh, Republic, in fact, the president of Ukraine, Simon Petlura. Like today's president Zelensky, he had a cultural background. Before becoming a politician, he worked as an editor, journalist, and art critic for 20 years. He personally knew all famous Ukrainian writers, composers, theater directors, and uh, opera singers, and even sang himself and conductor acquired during his student years. So he was loved in Ukrainian culture and music and desired to share his passion with Europe. In January 1919, he directed the famous Ukrainian conductor, Alexander Koshitz, to create a choir and to go on tour to Europe. And first of all to Paris, where at that time the Paris Peace Conference began its work and where the leaders of the victorious countries in the First World War drew the map of the post-war world and where the issue of Ukrainian independence was also to be solved. The project was instructed to the Ukrainian Ministry of Arts in cooperation with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. All singers were enrolled in public service. The choir was issued a state seal. On February 4, 1919, the day before the Russian Bolsheviks occupied Kyiv, the Ukrainian Republican Chapel, as the choir was called, left for the West. The premiere performance took place in Prague. At that time, neither the president of Czechoslovakia, Tomas Masaryk, nor the Czechoslovak people support, uh, supported Ukraine's independence. However, this is what the famous Czech conductor, Yaroslav Kržička, wrote after the Ukrainian premiere in Prague. Ukrainians came and concurred. Unfortunately, for too long, we hadn't been aware of them and seriously offended them when involuntary and without information, we lumped them together against their will with the Russian people. Our desire for a great Russia itself is a weak argument against nature, against the will and feeling of the entire Ukrainian nation, for which independence, just as, as it is for us, is everything. So from the very first country, the singers began to fulfill their diplomatic mission. The concert consisted of three sections, at first, the choir performed the anthem of Ukraine and the anthem of the host country. The ancient Ukrainian songs were played. New Year's song from the pre-Christian area, Shedrivki. Carols and hymns from the period of medieval and early modern periods. Folk songs of the 18th and 19th centuries. It was a sung uh, history of Ukraine in which the soul of the Ukrainian people was revealed. But uh, despite the success of the choir in Czechoslovakia, Ukrainian singers were not allowed to go to Paris. The French Minister of Foreign Affairs did not issue visas to Ukrainians as representatives of an unrecognized state. The choir had to wait months for permission. Meanwhile, they performed in Austria, which recognized the independence of Ukraine, and in neutral Switzerland. In Vienna, the Ukrainian premier caused a sensation. The local press wrote, Cultural maturity of Ukraine should become, for the world, the legitimization of its political independence. In Switzerland, the choir gave dozens of concerts in Bern, Geneva, Zurich, Lausanne, and other cities. The posters of the concerts, as you can see on the screen, were depicted on, in Ukrainian national blue and yellow colors with a trident. The, this greatly annoyed the Russian immigration, so Russians painted these posters with Russian slurs. Yeah. <laughs> but exactly thanks to the successful concerts in Switzerland, the choir managed to get visas to France. The French ambassador visited the Ukrainian concert in Bern and wrote a letter of recommendation to the French foreign ministry. Thanks to this, French foreign minister Stéphane Pichon agreed to grant visas to the choir. However, it was too late. As of November 1919, when the chorus finally reached Paris, the leaders of the Entente had already prepared a package of decisions regarding Ukraine. Central Ukraine was left to White Russia, Galicia to Poland, Transcarpathia to Czechoslovakia, and Bukovina to Romania. And even in spite of this, the Ukrainian choir started to reign in France. Dozens of performances in Paris, as well in Bordeaux, Marseille, and other cities, finally began to open eyes, um, the eyes of French to the subjectivity of Ukrainian nation. For me, the choir made an incredible impression that I haven't experienced since listening to Wagner's music in Munich, wrote Sorbonne professor Charles Senebos. No propaganda can be more effective for the recognition of the Ukrainian nation. 
Even the daughter of the French Prime Minister Theresa Yun Clemenceau was impressed by the Ukrainian performances. She promised conductor Koshitz to bring her father to a concert and help bring Ukrainian concerts to the state theaters of Paris. However, she didn't succeed. Ukraine was occupied. The Ukrainian government had to immigrate to Poland, where Simon Petlura concluded a military political alliance with the head of the Polish state, Józef Pilsudski. In May 1920, the alias managed to recapture Kyiv from Russian invaders, but in a few months, Bolsheviks approached Warsaw, threatening to invade Paris, London, and Berlin. But the Polish army, with the support of Ukrainians, managed to stop the Russian invasion to, of Europe. This battle would come to be called the miracle of the Vistula. However, the, no miracle, uh, there was no miracle for Ukraine. In October 1920, the war-weary Polish allies concluded a peace treaty with Bolshevik Russia. Poland recognized the independence of the puppet Ukrainian Soviet Socialistic Republic created by the Russian Bolsheviks in occupied Ukraine. The choir of Alexander Koshitz lost its motherland, but continued to promote the idea of an independent Ukraine abroad. After the France, Ukrainian singers performed in Belgium, the Netherlands, Great Britain, Germany, Poland, and Spain. During two years of European tour, they gave more than 200 concerts in 45 cities of 10 countries of Western Europe. More than 600 reviews were published in Western press supporting not only Ukrainian culture, but also Ukraine as a state. And actually, the favorite song of European public was Shedrik, an ancient Ukrainian New Year song arranged by Ukrainian composer Mykola Leontovich. The melody became a hit of Ukrainian tour and musical brand of Ukraine. It was called for an encore everywhere and translated into different European language. Meanwhile, in occupied Ukraine, Russian Bolsheviks start to kill in Ukrainian intelligentsia. And in January 1921, the author of the song Shedrik was also killed by Russian Chika, all Russian extraordinary commission for combating the counter revolutions. The composer was actually just finishing his first opera in his life. In 1922, the choir of Alexander Koshitz moved to the USA. But even then, Simon Petlura asked the Ukrainian conductor to promote the idea of Ukraine's independence. Dear Maestro, he wrote to, in his letter to Alexander Koshitz, when you are interviewed, discreetly say, Ukrainian music, song, independent, own, unlike, unique, is a part of independent Ukraine. On October 5, 1922, the choir gave its premier concert at Carnegie Hall. And actually, this day, Shedrick's song, the hit of Ukrainian concert in Europe, was sung for the first time in the American continent. A week before the premiere, the singers recorded a song, so we can listen to it now. And I hope you will recognize, again, this melody of Carol of the Bells, but with Ukrainian uh, uh, language. Shedrick is a bird, uh, it's not a bell. After the premiere in New York, the choir performed in other 150 other cities, US cities, as also in six other countries of North and South America. Everywhere, Shedrick was an, a hit on tour, as well as the voice of Ukraine's fighting for independence. Sing, capture of Ukraine, sing and Twitter, the spring that you look for will come, wrote Enrique Coelho Neto, the founder of the Brazilian Academy of Literature, after the premiere of the choir in Rio de Janeiro. However, there was a Russian winter in Ukraine. In May 1924, um, the choir tour ended. At the same time, the last diplomatic mission of Ukrainian Democratic Republic in Hungary kissed its activity. Two years later, Ukrainian head of the state, Simon Petlura, was shot dead in Paris. For long 70 years, Ukraine was under the occupation of the Kremlin. Repression 
artificial famine in 1932-1933, known as Holodomor, destruction of the Ukrainian history and culture, became tools of Russian state terror against Ukrainians. Ukrainians. The period of the Ukrainian Democratic Republic was dis discredited in the eyes of Ukrainians and the whole world by Russian propaganda. Ukrainian heroes were called criminals. Russian criminals became Ukrainian heroes. The only choristers who dared to return to the occupied motherland was murdered in the Kherson prison in 1937. The information about the conductor Koshitz, who glorified Ukrainian culture abroad, was forbidden. For the first time, he was mentioned in Soviet encyclopedia only in 1964-62, with note that he, quoting, adhered to nationalist statement. Ukrainian culture could develop free only in immigration. That's how actually American hit Carol the Bells appeared. The English text uh, for the Ukrainian song was written by the American conductor of Ukrainian origin, Peter Vyhovsky. He worked as a conductor of the school choir in New York and heard this song. He liked it so much, so he decided to present the song on American radio. However, the children of his chorus didn't know Ukrainian. He wrote the English text. I discarded the Ukrainian text about Shadrick and instead concentrated on the merry tinkle bells, which I heard in the music. In 1936, he published this song with the New York music publishing house Carl Fischer. In this score, he noted that this is Ukrainian Christmas carol created by the composer Mikola Leontovich. He is only the author of the text and arrangement. The song became an American bestseller. In the following decades, it was used for more than 100 famous American films and commercials. And I think you recognize the most famous uh, film with this song, Home Alone. Every year at Christmas it is played all over the world by a wide variety of musicians, but very few of them know about the Ukrainian history of this song. Moreover, despite the fact that the score of the song indicated that this is Ukrainian carol, in America the song, in America, the song began to be called Russian. For example, in 1946 the Robert Shaw, uh, Robert Shaw Choir released an album of Christmas carols where Carol of the Bells, as you can see on the screen, was called a typical Russian folk type carol created by the composer Leontovich about whom the authors couldn't find any information. Similarly, everything that was under the occupation of the Soviet Russia was perceived in the West as Russian, even Ukrainian songs. So, only the political liberation of Ukraine could give freedom for the Ukrainian people and culture. This was constantly lobbied by Ukrainian immigration abroad. In 1944, the con uh, conductor Alexander Koshitz published in New York the song Oret Ribernum in the Middle, which you also may know as it is sung all over the world, known in, uh, now in solidarity with Ukraine. However, look at how it was translated into English, Ukraine we will free. Finally, in 1991, Ukraine was liberated. For the past 30 years, we have been reclaiming our history, language, and culture. In 1991, Alexander Koshit Street appeared in Kyiv. Last year, the first commemorative, uh, commemorative plaque was installed in his honor. However, Russia still has not come to terms with our independence. On February 24, Russian dictator Vladimir Putin declared Ukraine is a failed state and Ukrainians as a nation do not exist and began the liberation of Ukraine from the Nazis. And it is very symbolic that the first Russian rocket that flew into a residential quarter of Kyiv on the morning of February 25 hit a house on Alexander Koshet Street. The same conductor who 100 years ago proved to the world that Ukrainians exist. And a few days later, the famous Ukrainian musician Andriy Hlevnyuk sang the song All the Red Vibernum in the Middle on Sofia Square in Kyiv. A new song has entered the arena of Ukrainian cultural diplomacy. Pink Floyd the other, and other famous world musicians sing it in support of Ukraine. And this time, the whole democratic world stands uh, in solidarity with Ukraine. And this time, we believe Ukraine will win, as the victory of Ukraine is the victory of the civilized world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, <coughs> Tina, for your presentations. And you give us uh, good insights of about 
well, the importance of cultural diplomacy, even um, under these circumstances that the Ukrainian state didn't exist over many years. So we are going to turn to the next presentation um, by Nadia. Nadia Kontrarenko is a senior research fellow at the Department of Cultural Heritage of the Institute of Cultural Research um, of the National Academy of Arts of the Ukraine. And, well, her particular interests are the cultural studies, history, education, and memory policy. And she will speak about the deconstruction of Soviet mythology of the Second World War in the Ukrainian memory policy. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay, good evening everyone. Firstly, I would like to thank organizing for inviting me and for possibility to be a part of this intellectual celebration. Uh, every day after February 24, besides, uh, besides the sadness and grief, we feel happiness when we have a luxury uh, of ordinary life and work, uh, when we have uh, time to reading, writing and communicating with other academicians. Uh, and I want to express a great gratitude, which I feel for all kind of help and support that Ukrainians received during this stage of Russian-Ukrainian wars. Uh, title of my paper is uh, The Construction of the Soviet Mythology of the Second World War in Ukrainian Memory Policy. It is a well-known fact that Soviet mythology of the Second World War, the concept of great patriotic war, was one of the KL elements of Soviet ideology. This concept, inherited by contemporary Russia, is one of the pillars of the Russian world concept, which crystallized after the Soviet Union collapse and shaped contempor contemporary Russia's ideology. In Ukraine, as in Europe, the collapse of the Soviet Union is seen as a tri triumph of freedom and democracy, whereas for Putin and his supporters in Russia, it was the biggest catastrophe of the 20th century. The Russian world idea was conceptualized in the early 2000s to recover and preserve the empire in the new globalized world. It is a space without the borders. Russian language and culture, Orthodox faith, historical memory based on the common past of brotherly peoples, and especially reverent attitude towards the Great Patriotic War, a secular event that turned into sacred because of the great victory of the Soviet Union. This victory became a cornerstone of the neo-imperialist Russia feeling of cultural superiority and has been actively exploited for support of political regime of the Kremlin, especially under Putin. The heritage of victory provides the foundation for, for Russia's claims a special position in world because Soviet liberator soldiers freed Europe from the Nazi enemy. Key, key buildings block of the Soviet concept of great patriotic war are uh, first, distortion of the war chronology by indicating of the war beginning not in 1939, but in 1941. Uh, the Soviet, uh, second, the Soviet, therefore the Russian army, won the great victory and saved humanity. At the same time, the role of the Allies was silenced and Soviet army crimes in European countries were concealed. All national, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Poles, Estonians, resistance movement to the Nazis, not associated with the Soviet army, were depicted as traitors, accomplices with fascists. Soviet, Soviet and Russian, uh, so Russian people was portrayed as the greatest victim of the war. Instead, information about other national tragedies, the Holocaust, the deportation of Ukrainians and other peoples, the Thurgun gen genocide of Crimean Tatars people was forbidden or marginalized. All of these building blocks not only preserved, but became an organic part of the Russian world concept. So, any challenge to the Soviet war mythology interpreted by Russians as a direct threat to the existence of Russia as a state. 
As experience of the whole period of Ukraine independence show, especially the last eight years, Soviet mythology of the Second World War remains one of the key elements of the contemporary stage of Russia-Ukrainian war, which caused not only the death of thousands of Ukrainians, but led to destroying a huge amount of our cultural heritage. In early 2014, the memory of the Second World War was used to create a positive attitude to the expected action of Ru Russian militants. Militants. The Russian propagandist continued to use the theme of the fascism of Ukraine to its advantage. In the first half of 2014, the Ukrainian leadership was presented as a junta that illegally seized power, or as fascists, the struggle with whom seems to continue the tradition of Soviet soldiers during the Second World War. At the same time, during the past 20 years, there has been a step-by-step -step deconstruction of this mythology in Ukraine memory culture and memory policy. First in academic research, then in history textbooks, in some museums, exhibition, and TV programs, in activities of civil society organizations. Finally, in April 2015, after adoption of uh, so-called decommunization laws, there has been substantial changes in the state memory policy, in official discourse of the Second World War, and in commemorative practices. Different approaches to history of the 20th century in Ukraine and Russia influenced in definition of memory policy. For example, Russian historians Irina Savelyeva and Sergei Politaev define it as, I quote, the process of ideologization of knowledge about a past, end of quote. Some known Ukrainian historians, like Georgi Kasyanov, also promoted such definitions, claiming that memory policy or historical policy is purposeful construction and utilitarian use of ideas about the past that are beneficial to the authorities in the struggle for power. Instead, Ukrainian policy memory analyst Alexander Retsenko stressed that I quote, the memory policy process is not some kind of social engineering enterprise that produced required ideas about a nation past in the conscience of subaltern masses, as some theorist uh, suggests. It is better understood as a constant, complicated, and conflicted interaction, cooperation, competition, dispute, struggle of numerous actors and stakeholders who have interests, values, goals, and resources, uh, resources of their own. A similar approach proposed by Dorota Molchevska Pavelik and Tomas Pavelik. They are stressed that a great number of institutions in contemporary society have the potential to act as agent of memory policy. Uh, it is worth uh, nothing, noting here the significant influence of Russia non-democratic state propaganda regarding the so-called common past, grounded on cliché of great Russia culture and great victory based on Soviet nostalgia, always remains strong enough in Ukraine. In early 90s, Ukraine was oversaturated with Soviet historical mythology and sites of memory. No other historical theme could compete with uh, uh, the theme of the Great Patriotic War in terms of the number of publications, uh, memoirs, academic and literary prose, TV programs, documentaries, films, paintings, monuments, and so, and so on. As a result of Soviet era, out of uh, 47,000 registered monuments, 80% uh, of these uh, thousand monuments were monuments of the great of Soviet army soldiers, partisans, and other so-called victims of fascism. Therefore, since reconstruction uh, of independence, there have been two main uh, competitive versions of historical narrative in Ukraine. The nation one, innovative, suggesting or offering a new interpretation of past, and the Soviet or pro-Russian one, affirmative, that supports existing, then dominant interpretation of historical events or personalities. Each of these narratives represent a different attitude towards Second World War. 
World War mythology. The National trying to deconstruct it and form a Ukrainian dimension of the Second World War. The Soviet trying to preserve it by using, by uh, the, by using the cliche about Ukrainian Nazi, which distort the truth about the war. During the 90s and early 2000s, the process of the communization of Ukrainian culture unfolded in Ukraine. No more forbidden works, names, or historical events. On the other hand, political power remains in the hands of the former Soviet uh, Ukrainian elites, which did not support the idea of official condemnation of Soviet totalitarian regime as a criminal. During years of Kravchuk and Kuchma presidency, most, most of the Ukrainian parliament uh, deputy, likewise many of academicians, educational and cultural establishment, remained supporter of Soviet historical narrative about Ukraine's history and history of Second World War. In 2000, this led to adoption of the, uh, of the law uh, on the perpetuation of victory in the Great Patriotic War which was written off from a similar Russian law adopted in 1996. According to this Ukrainian law, all Soviet commemorative practices were preserved, including the notion about preventing falsification of the history of the Great Patriotic War in academic research, educational materials, textbooks and media. Why were the Ukrainian president and parliament scared of so-called falsification of history? That's because Ukrainian historians started analyzing previously inaccessible or prohibited documents, hence not only developed new interpretation of war events, but began to deconstruct Soviet mythology and for the Ukrainian dimension. At the same time, some scholars participated in the writing of Ukraine history textbooks. Uh, need to be recalling that history of Ukraine as a separate subject was not taught at school until 1989, uh, when the history of Ukrainian SSR was included in the list of obligatory subjects. Uh, the first Ukrainian history textbooks promoted basic elements of the Soviet scheme of victory. Victory of the Great October Socialist Revolution, creation of the USSR, and victory in the Great Patriotic War as the key events of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, a striking example uh, of powerful resistance to the uh, of a powerful resistance to the construction of Soviet mythology was the situation around around one of the first textbook of Ukraine's history prepared by the historian Fedor Turchenko, published in 1994 and recommended by the Ministry of Education. Already in the annotation, the author promises to pay special attention to the issues which were falsified by the Soviet historiography. Uh, tragic fate of Ukraine under the condition of Soviet totalitarian regime and a struggle with foreign occupation during the Second World War. Uh, and uh, the content of the textbooks triggered a wave of, of outrage. Some MPs, communist members of the Committee of Science and Education, began to publish open letters and articles in the newspapers calling for banning the textbooks since it, I quote, falsifies the heroic past of Ukraine, distorts historical facts, silences the role of the Communist Party in the great victory and salvation of mankind. The well-known newspaper Krimska Pravda published articles where the cut-in execution is called fake news invented in the West. The deportation of Crimean Tatars people is uh, termed a comfortable relocation. And the creation of a new program and textbooks on the history of Ukraine is described as an attempt to disconnect fraternal Slavic people and abandon the recent happy past of Ukrainian people. Uh, so many new textbooks published during 2005-2010 uh, in, in, in detail portray the strengthening of the totalitarian regime during the 30s, militarization and preparation of the Soviet Union for Second World War. The chronological boundaries of the Second World War uh, are expanded to August 23, 1939, and signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, 
The new wave of decolonization and uh, Soviet mythology deconstruction, which began after the Orange Revolution, especially in 2007-2008, became an official memory policy. Uh, but Yushchenko's attitude to the historic heritage of the Soviet period and consequently his policies were of dual nature. He condemned Holodomor as a genocide of Ukrainian people organized by Soviet regime and ordered removal of monuments to Soviet leaders. However, this did not include memorials of the Great Patriotic War, constituting over a half of all memorials in Ukraine. This approach, was, which also included continuation of Soviet-style practices of commemoration of the Great Patriotic War, made the ultimate goal of the communization culture hardly achievable. But even Yushchenko's attempts to reconcile veterans of Red Army and national resistance are strongly contradicting to the cult of victory that had gained a wave of new popularity in Russia from 2005. This wave of great, great victory, sacralization, and condemnation of Ukrainian fascists or Nazi united Russia's various institutions. For example, Historical Memory Fund, TV Channel Star, commission under the president of the Russian Federation to counter attempts to falsify history, and uh, some individual actors, historians, TV presenters, politicians. They produced thousands of copies of books, dozens of TV shows and films for defending the historical truth about the Great Patriotic War. It also made a big impact in Ukrainian political and cultural space. For example, in 2007, a uh, uh, member of parliament, Kolesnichenko, uh, uh, who fled uh, to Russia with Yanukovych, uh, he uh, wrote an open letter which contained a call to rewrite all programs and textbooks on the history of Ukraine because they, I quote, are an example of political frauds and an insult to the actual historical settings of the Ukrainian past. The most horrible elements of this obscurantism is... Uh, that children are systematically taught about Russia's aggressive, aggressive attitude toward Ukraine." End of quote. Russian propaganda and Soviet mythology of the Second World War, alongside with condemnation of Ukraine's Nazification, nationalization of history, were distributed in European countries under the anti-Nazi slogan that are consonant with European culture of remembrance. It is not surprising that President Yanukovych promoted a Soviet nostalgia which was deeply connected with Great Patriotic War mythology. His presidency was a turn toward this mythology in official memory policy. The law on the victory flag was adopted in April 2011 by Ukrainian parliament that envisages public display of Soviet red flags, euphemistically called copies of the flag of victory, on public buildings during the official commemoration alongside the state flag of Ukraine, which was perceived by millions of Ukrainians as an insult. But the attempt to return to the mythology of the Great Patriotic War that took place at the official discourse of memory policy have not had a significant impact on the academic research and educational literature. Moreover, groups of academicians and civil society figures started activities which strongly opposed these attempts to return Soviet mythology in education and commemorative practices. For example, a group of scholars held a public hearing and adopted a memorandum stating, I quote, it is unacceptable to exploit the memory of the Second World War and the victory in it to promote the so-called idea of East Slavic unity, which is actualized by neo-imperial forces. It is unacceptable to return to the schemes and stereotypes of Soviet and Russian historiography." End of quote. Uh, during the official Victory Day celebration, a group of students and activists were marching alongside the pro-Soviet demonstration with banners and slogans re that ridiculous the Russian immortal regiment action promoted by official circles. Uh, 
In 2014, for the first time, interest of the state and significant part of society to reject the Soviet and Russian concept of the Great Patriotic War were combined, and the willingness to make more systemic changes in commemorative pra practices uh, has increased. Uh, two laws, uh, on, uh, a law on remembering the victory over Nazism in the Second World War and law on condemning communist and national socialist Nazi totalitarian regime and prohibiting the propagation of their symbols uh, were adopted. But that does not apply to monuments and symbols dedicated to the Great Patriotic War, even if they include prohibited communist symbols. And... Uh, Describing the end of war, the many Ukrainian uh, authors of textbooks now do not use the term liberation in reference to Ukraine. Instead, they use the expulsion of Hitler's coalition troops from Ukraine or the expulsion of Nazi invaders from Ukraine. So, there has been a main uh, trends in memory policy and commemorative practices regarding the Second World War set up since 2015. The communization, uh, rejecting Soviet mythology and its, its terminology, Euro integration, introducing some European commemoration practices and symbols, and Ukrainization, emphasizing on Ukrainian dimension of the Second World War, including Ukrainian liberation movement into narrative of wars. And I have to... Uh, to my conclusion, go to my conclusion, and I want to end with a quote from the article by uh, Roger, uh, Roger Murhouse, Why Should We Remember August uh, 23, which was published in August uh, this year on the site of European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. I quote, some might imagine that with Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine, plunging the European continent once more into war. Arguments about the finer points of the 20th century history are somehow a luxury that can be ill afforded. I would argue the contrary, however. Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of its neighbor is merely the latest installment of a bloody continuum a new offense in a catalog of crimes stretching back to the Nazi Soviet pact and beyond, which betray the mindset of suspicions, paranoia, and naked aggression that has long guided the Kremlin worldview. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Nadia, for your presentations which uh, shows us how, well, complicated uh, is then the, the history of the Second World War, in particular in the region uh, where today's Ukraine, uh, where the, the damage and uh, the war simply was very intense and a lot of Ukrainian soldiers lost their life uh, as part of the uh, Red Army, and today, well, uh, as you showed us, um, the, the, the Ukrainian has to find their place in the war um, between against the Germans and, and um, today's also against uh, Russia. Now we going on on issues about security and also weaponry. And the next speaker is Alexander Svetlov. He is a um, historian from the Museum of Soviet Occupation in Kiev. And he has broad experience of, uh, well, different um, affiliations in, um, in Austria and Germany. And uh, he will speak now about weapons as mass delusion, Russia's anti-Ukrainian policy in discourse and practice. So the floor is yours, Alexander. Thank you very much. Well, as they say, everything, everything seems to, be, to have been said, but not, but not by everyone. So I'm the next, and I'm very happy to have so many Ukrainians around, and I, 
I think we in this 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 way we we can we can be almost complete on the on the subject. Uh, many issues that I was going to address have already been mentioned, have already been men mentioned and uh, dealt with. So I had to rewrite it, amend a bit my uh, slightly closer. <coughs> So I had to rewrite and amend the presentation a bit. Uh, in my view, while approaching the subject, we need to be uh, to employ eclectic approaches, thus drawing from different uh, uh, disciplines. Generally, uh, scientists are faced with a challenge to counter adequately a whole range of propaganda. It's warts and hows, sources and techniques in all their forms. Uh, fully aware of the dynamics coming from intersection of formal and informal propaganda and how each of these reinforce and feed each other. For that, going into neighboring in disciplines such as history, politics, psychology, even psychiatry is often uh, advisable. Uh, the classical look at propaganda is that it's state-led, vertical, top-down, but now in the Ukrainian context we're faced with its new quality that became transnational aimed at the other, the enemy. Apart from positive qualities such as societal consolidation, and structuring of relations and communities, the propaganda has become uh, vicious in Putin's context. Quite in line with the historical comparisons of the Third Reich, Russian propaganda has found to be most <coughs> fruitful when resonating with already preset beliefs of the local Ukrainian audience, their mindset, worldviews, and political preferences. As it is also <coughs> claimed that propaganda is a communication which strikes home, it's a targeted communication aimed at the recipient, with individual or collective uh, belief system. So the propaganda is thus a mixture of ideas, different topics and messages coming from both formal and informal so sources. As one of the th Russian thinkers, Mikhail Bakhtin, once stated, if you live inside a lie, you are bound to become a, <coughs> a tool of lie in somebody else's hands. Asymmetric warfare impacted the way of news coverage, reporting styles, and made the role of states military machine preponderant. Due to this, it's not necessarily the physically weaker state that automatically has poorer chances to win. Uh, at, at this point, since mentioning the, the receiver, and for our context, it's the Ukrainian society, I, would, I, like, citing, I like citing Hans van Zon, a British scientist who wrote a book in 2000 and pointed out specific anti-modern attitudes uh, of Ukraine's population, <coughs> which he saw as an obstacle to social and economic progress and if I may add, also made the society, these traits made the society very susceptible, very recipient to the messages sent out by the Putin's propaganda. In general, the peculiar nature of the pseudo-modern superstructure of Ukrainian society can only be properly understood in the context of specific social practices that sustain it, he said. According to him, the Stalinist rule and the communist and Tsarist past produced a particular system of values, norms and behavior that was persistent and able to replicate itself. He proposed the concept of post-Soviet social psychological syndrome, which was characterized, which is characterized by the following elements. For instance, the cult of power, as there is no tradition of challenging power because that has been punished during communism. So therefore people have generally become very compliant and tend, uh, tended to accept almost everything that was imposed on them. As a result, the Ukrainian society was uh, a low trust and fr fragmented one with the development of horizontal cooperation networks. Also, concerning the attitudes towards the state and public sphere, the Ukrainians were viewed as thinking in terms of dichotomy which has a moral <coughs> undertone. The nation good versus the state bad. Us good versus them bad. People good versus the rulers bad. Also, the people th thought that the state had to provide with, uh, them with a range of services and uh, often blamed the state for their personal failures. Also, the culture of dependence 
Fanzon has asserted that many inhabitants of Ukraine could be characterized by, by extreme passivity and inertia. Uh, they did not believe in the possibility of changes and social cooperation. These attitudes could be called learned helplessness and reflected people's lack of initiative and uh, unwillingness to take responsibility. He stated that in Ukraine, the majority of the people felt themselves victims of their situation. Also, the last, <coughs> not least, marginalization of intellect. The Ukrainians were depicted by him uh, <coughs> as being far from recognizing meritocracy. Uh, compliance with those in power was the main requirement for influential positions. As a result, the elites were not competent, and at the same time, talented people uh, <coughs> got involved, more involved in art and science, but not in politics. Uh, concerning Putin's regime propaganda, <coughs> the, the, its qualities are generally volatile, unstable, and flexible in their ways of influence. It's able to produce fiction and to criticize everything at the same time. Some even compared, compared it uh, to, the, to an onion peeled down to the cynical core as it may target not necessarily its direct, direct target, which is Ukraine, but also on a tangent, some other issues like uh, the collective West, individual countries, especially United States, also uh, pan-European organizations like European Union and also NATO. And also talking about the plot of Jews, feminists and gays. Uh, propaganda is indispensable for Putin's regime as it lacks a clear-cut ideology which used to be present in classical fascist regimes. Uh, there is a consensus nowadays that Russia has now become a fascist state with all its classical 14 traits. It's now also manifested itself in, aggress in aggression towards neighboring peaceful, uh, unprovoking democratic states. And after Ukraine, if Putin is to succeed, other states will follow. Uh, as Putin proclaimed it in his demands on the eve of the February's invasion. So it's now a matter of, of uh, whether tyranny and undemocratic state could claim triumph over dem democracy. Russia is notoriously <coughs> is notorious for keeping conflicts revived at demand, be it even Kaliningrad and uh, Northern Caucasus. Also, historically, uh, there is a certain predisposition in, 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 in Russia to uh, depreciate the Ukrainian people. It's been the case not only with uh, Alexander Dugin, who, is, uh, who became quite, quite renowned recently after his daughter has been, um, has been killed in a car accident actually in a car explosion, and uh, who, who was also active writing uh, on the subject of uh, Eurasianism and published some of uh, up to 80, 80 publications that he has, and uh, labored, labored very actively, actively and effectively at the concept of Ruski Mir. But there's also others like that somebody that we would not necessarily have thought about. For instance, Solzhenitsyn, and before him, uh, Tsarist white guardists, and also a, a renowned Russian fascist uh, thinker, Ilyin, who is claimed to be the, the most um, likable and actually the, the uh, how would you call it, sort of favorite figure of Vladimir Putin, who cites him sometimes in his speeches and uh, reads him a lot. Also, we should not discard uh, the fact that Russia's propagandists are quite sincere in, their, in what they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> living in the world of lies, they somehow show affection and uh, actually truthfulness and sincerity in, 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 in what they produce. Concerning the Ru Russian intelligentsia and the uh, general public, it's been noted on many occasions is that uh, they uh, chose, they have chosen special, special forms where 
subjectivity is more or less in a passive tone. That is, uh, they keep on wondering also in the press, what is it with the world? What is it happening? What is it happening around Russia? And never puts a question, what's wrong with us? And no, fa no fault laying at, uh, at uh, their own doorsteps. It's just uh, the world which gone inside. Also, uh, of the Russia's politicians, which we know to be or to have been uh, democratic, like Nemtsov and uh, others, uh, it's claimed that uh, their public views of Ukraine has been uh, a bit problematic. And that at times, they questioned the status of Crimea, of Sevastopol, and uh, suppo uh, supported uh, inherently and publicly uh, uh, Russia's annexation of uh, na neighbors' uh, territories. So there is not much of a reliance, not much of a cure to be expected to come from, from within the Russian uh, Federation. Uh, also concerning the, the, the tools and means, uh, Russia today was founded uh, over 15 years ago, and uh, also an army of internet trolls has been <coughs> has been uh, created and all meant uh, to control domestic Russian media environment and to sow doubt in Western public sphere. And this way to influence <coughs> Western decision makers in their decision making. Uh, of the techniques that they used, one of the prominent was so-called information flooding and it was engaged in the case of a shot down Malaysian airplane flight, MH17. Uh, it was a vivid example. Uh, the, uh, the events which, which followed after the, or during the investigation of the press conference, um, almost dozens, dozens of parallel story, stories have uh, come to the fore, which were meant artificially made and confronting each other. Uh, willfully made and meant to distract and to confuse the reader, the recipient. And that's what it managed to do, both domestically and, and on the international level. After so many years, by way, by way of example, after so many years, um, the court in, in, in the Netherlands finally made its decision this year, but still failed to name a proper uh, benefactor, so to say, a proper the proper one responsible for, for downing down of the, of the airplane and almost 300 people killed. So they omitted the, 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 persona, the persona of Putin from their verdict. Also, uh, post-truth entered Oxford <coughs> Dictionary quite late, only in 2016. Uh, so the West, in my view, effectively missed the development in the field of hybrid operations and informational operations. And the role of information warfare is propagated years before by the so-called um, General Gerasimov Doctrine. Uh, and fake news were also part and parcel of it, uh, as it contained propagandistic elements, conspiracy theories, and rumors which could undermine the mental state and belief system of both the individual and collectives. Now there is, a, uh, concerning the general <coughs> Gerasimov doctrine, there is a whole list of, <laughs> of things that, um, that actually you could do it yourself. Uh, uh, I think coming, <coughs> coming to, to close, uh, I'd like to, to mention uh, the techniques that one could use individually as a way of protection from uh, such hybrid, hybrid threats as uh, disinformation both individually and also at the state level. So the, uh, the, the recommendations given out by the Ukrainian side uh, for the individuals reads like that, is that uh, be cautious uh, what, what you read, what you hear, and always uh, double check and question and uh, the content and uh, you have to be certain that it is uh, the person who, who, who who is really, uh, you know, a, a, a real author who is behind the message. And for instance, if you come across uh, uh, 
colorful and emotionally loaded words and, and notions. You have to be cautious. Or the, when, when you come at a strange argumentation, the logical fallacies in it, where you know logics and, and truthfulness could be put in doubt, where you feel that statistics and uh, you know num num numbers cipher, you know numbers <coughs> and uh, references are sort of uh, doubtful. Uh, also, the experts which are cited, who, who, who are they? Also, the use of ununderstandable terminology without uh, proper expanding on it, uh, and the repetitious, uh, repetitious texts, and uh, <clears throat> also familiarity with certain names like in Ukraine's context that used to be Yulka for Yulia Timoshenko or Petka for Pyotr, Tim, uh, Pyotr Poroshenko, etc. As far as uh, state recommendations were concerned, uh, the, the Ukrainian state, but also other states, uh, and also collective actors, are uh, advised as a way of countering the Russian propaganda. Yeah, I'll be closing soon. <laughs> Uh, is advisable to map the impact of public opinion and to properly assess the effect of, of uh, pro-Russian campaigns uh, while studying carefully the sentiments uh, of public polls and uh, the sentiments behind. And also deconstructing and exposing the pro-Russian campaigns, properly understanding uh, the system, <coughs> thus investing in uh, proper scientific research in the, in the subject matters. And that also includes education of uh, broader layers of, of people, civilians, uh, and exposing and educating people uh, with propaganda techniques, techniques uh, which could be used against them. Also on a state level, uh, uh, as a part of a uh, pro propaganda rebuttal, also, the arguments which are inherently or explicitly used against, you know, coming from the Russian side, they have to be decoded and uh, explained and uh, properly, uh, properly analyzed. And also, a whole issue about information security uh, at, the, at, at all level, levels of, of, of the state. Uh, so, I think. In terms of time, I could, I could stop here, and if you have any questions, and I'm sure you will, I'm more than ready to, to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, that you gave us uh, numerous examples of, uh, I would say, uh, Russian mindset and stance of Russian elites, in particular, towards uh, the Ukraine. Now we are going on to our last presentation today <laughs> and in our panel. Um, Jade McGlynn uh, will do this. Uh, she is a political scientist and, well, if I take it rightly, a Slavic philologist. Uh, uh, no, no, no? Oh, oh, okay, then, well, then I'm, I'm wrong. Um, but certainly you are an expert on Russian and, and that's why I thought you yeah. also uh, uh, studied philology. Um, and she is a senior researcher at the Middleborough Institute for International Studies and she, her main interest is on Russian state media discourse and the political use of history in Russia but also in Eastern Europe at all. So. The floor is yours, Jade. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to try to find the clicker before I begin. Um, just so I... Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so as the um, the only non-Ukrainian, uh, thank you so much, um, speaking on this panel, I deservedly, I think, feel um, some, some, some pressure in terms of, um, you know, describing, of course, um, what's happening. I've... 
I've been working on Russian uses of history, specifically around um, the, the war in Ukraine since, well, for eight years. And I don't quite clearly, obviously, not in the worst, in my worst nightmares, did I think that we would be discussing it in, in these sorts of, of conditions. Um, and I, I suppose I just wanted to quickly say before we get into the sort of theoretical aspects and, and I sort of make you all desperate for, for your dinner rather than hearing about, um, about dry theoretical bits, you know, how much um, I'm, I, I feel um, very honored to, to, to be with, with, with free Ukrainian um, speakers. And I think over, over the last eight months and, and three days, um, Certainly, many people around the world have been um, amazed by the resilience and the bravery of the Ukrainian people, by their sense of humor, which we were discussing um, just, just before the panel started, and also, of course, by Zelensky's incredible abilities to deliver sort of barnstorming, amazing speeches. And we've heard throughout the conference today about um, sort of how Zelensky has done a wonderful job in, in tailoring his his different speeches and to the values, but also to the, the history and to what resonates in terms of history in, in different countries. And I want to build on that a little bit today. Um, and this paper looks to compare how Russian and Ukrainian official representatives during the first six months of this full-scale war have sought to use historical narratives to explain their arguments, sort of to persuade other nations to support their stance. Um, and I analyze it through the prism of what I call uh, memory diplomacy. Um, so what is memory diplomacy? Seems like a good place to start. Um, I define it here as political actors, identification, creation, and development of commonalities of memory for geopolitical purposes and or bilateral relations. So unlike memory wars, which is the, the title of the panel, so hopefully I won't get kicked off, but unlike memory wars, which involve different actors um, contesting their country's historical and normally especially wartime roles, memory diplomacy is about coalescing and converging the historical narratives around these roles. Um, that said, there's a pretty symbiotic relationship between uh, memory diplomacy and memory wars in the sense that um, some diplomatic actors' efforts to converge these narratives could be directed against perceived or real uh, monomic others. Um, and so it could function as part of a, of a sort of memory coalition, I suppose, as we saw, as we've, we saw a bit earlier um, in Dmitriev's panel on, um, on Russian and Serbian. Um, sort of memory alliance. Um, a distinct, another distinguishing feature of, of memory diplomacy is that the actors involved um, are promoting their own narratives and commemorative traditions, so this idea of sort of memory exports, they're exporting what is their own to external audiences, but they also engage with and sort of tinker with and, and, and change and promote sort of positive historical narratives of a second country, and they try to kind of um, build, build their own narratives into those, creating, creating memory alliances. And both of these actions contribute to achieving influence, reinforcing relationships, and just generally sort of bolstering a country's reputation in a second or in several other countries. Um, and the important thing here is it's not just a one-way affair where you have one side kind of imposing its exports or narratives, but there needs to be some sort of interaction, so a mutual two-way engagement in which both sides are active, even if perhaps they are not equally active. Um, in terms of the more sort of traditional um, theorization, uh, as opposed to definitions, let's get it out of the way. Um, so in a previous article that came out at the start of this year that I wrote together with Yelena Juranovic, um, we together theorized memory diplomacy using um, the example of, of Russo-Serbian memory diplomacy as our case study. Um, that said, I think they're going to need to be a lot more case studies because clearly that's quite a specific, that's a very specific case. I mean, all case studies are specific, but there's more work to be done uh, to summarize. Um, a lot of the theorization I'm going to say comes from that article, so I'll run for it a little bit, but it's getting late and you can all just read the article if, if, if you're that interested, which some people may be. Um, so memory diplomacy understood as a form of memory politics that involves external sort of memory agents and audiences in which memory serves as a strategic resource in the struggle for power. Now this is, as we know, because we're all at a conference dedicated to this topic, of course, the use of historical narratives as a tool of foreign policy is, is very much sort of a growing but still somewhat nascent field. 
um, you know, whether or not that's in the application of historical analogies or, of course, the securitization of memory. And um, or um, Catherine um, Backleitner, who's going to be with us tomorrow, albeit online, her theory of, of diplomacy with memory, which looks at sort of how um, sort of in international political behavior and, and official performance between states um, with a shared traumatic history aimed at conveying a certain sort of historic image to achieve what she describes as rational aims on the international stage. I would differentiate memory diplomacy here, which um, while based on, on traveling memory content and sort of shared narratives and images and practices and whatnot that, that, that do resonate, um, it's not about nations that have a common past in the sense of um, that the um, countries of, of that used to be in the Soviet Union might would have a common past. I suppose if we think about it in terms of trade, is that they wouldn't have a common market. Um, I probably shouldn't get too much into this analogy as a British person, but um, they wouldn't have a common market, but they would need to create a trade deal um, and send exports. Now, moving on very quickly, um, memory does not travel on its own, of course. Um, it's, it's the nation state actors, infrastructures of power um, that enable the movement of memory, um, which is sort of mediated and, and consecrated for institutions. And so whilst memory diplomacy is self-evidently a sort of a matter of, of foreign relations, I would also place it within public diplomacy efforts, the definition, using the definition from Mannheim provided on the slide, but also again, differentiating it. Well, not differentiating it, but not, not conflating it with soft power, because I think that really for successful memory diplomacy to happen, there needs to be an element of soft power that it needs, it can only, a memory alliance can only be constructed if you have that pull of, of monomic attraction in, in, in the partner country, but it's, it's not necessarily the same thing. Um, as, as noted, um, there's, this is a nascent area of, of international relations, but also I think um, to, to scholars particularly of, of the Russian case where there's um, some really excellent research on the use of historical memory as a resource um, of, of, of Russian public diplomacy, of Russian propaganda, you know, um, within the, the former Soviet Union. Um, and I mean, some of that featured earlier on, on the margins of IJAN's fascinating research, um, but it's not so much sort of outside um, of, of, of the former Soviet space. And there's quite meaningful differences um, between the practices of Russia's practices of public diplomacy in, um, in, and, in and also in terms of memory diplomacy, in depending on whether or not they're targeted at the former Soviet Union or, or further afield. And that's in particular the memory diplomacy area, well, only the memory diplomacy area, it will be what I'm going to be researching over the next um, six years um, uh, at King's College London. So if some of this still feels quite like it's at its beginning, it's very much because it is at its beginning. Um, so I will um, perhaps not expect, but hope, hope for your forgiveness in any slightly unformed thoughts. But if we... Um, move on now so I think it's worth just quickly drawing out but I don't need to do too much because of Nadia's excellent um description um of of the um the great patriotic war myth which her, although her paper was focused on Ukraine obviously also described a lot of of what is true in, in Russia um I would say that um one of the most obvious differences in in Russia and Ukraine is a sort of um as, as monomic actors or as, as memory actors. Um, and the most obvious difference would be that Russia is sort of far more virulent than Ukraine traditionally on the, on the international stage. For Russia, the notion, as we've heard, that, that everyone must have the ostensibly correct version of, of the Great Patriotic War of, of World War II, um, which is, of course, the, the Kremlin-approved version would be the correct version. Um, and the others are trying to, to falsify the real history of that war is, is, is a cornerstone of, of the Putinist worldview. And I would argue maybe, well, I would argue of where we are today. And I think on a certain level, Russia's securitization of, 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 um, and, and sensitivity to historical narratives reflects actually quite rational state interests in this case, given that Russia's geopolitical legitimacy relies um, at least in their view, on, on, the, world, on the great victory of, of 1945 in, in many ways. Um, in her paper, Nadia um, spoke about sort of an intensification post-2005. 
um, which is certainly true. I would also mark as an important day Putin's return, return to the presidency in 2012, um, which was also a year that he decreed by executive order to be the year of history. Um, and we saw another sort of intensification there um, in, in a series of intensifications in terms of the promotion of the, the great patriotic war as a, a unifying national force. Um, leading to what Yelena um, Rozhjestvinskaya has described as the hyper-exploitation of the past victory, which involves the constant making present of the war experience. And the, the memory, or the cultural memory, um, since the communicative memories largely died out of, of the great victory and how it was achieved, of course, were, were codified in Russia's 2020 constitutional amendment. Um, and it's also become, I suppose, that we've also seen the, the banalization of the memory as well in the sense that it's become part of the everyday fabric, both in terms of popular culture, um, but also even just spatially and in terms of um, sort of the muralization of the war. So government organizations such as the Russian Historical Society, which is headed by um, the, the, um, the head of the, of the SVR, the um, Foreign Intelligence um, Agency Sergei Narushkin, and also the Russian Military Historical Society, which is headed by Vladimir Medinsky, who was one of the first people to be, he used to be the Minister of Culture, now he's a presidential aide, and he's currently um, basically in the doghouse because he, he was running uh, negotiations, he, he was there uh, leading negotiations with the, with the Ukrainians, and I mean, he's has some pretty he called ukraine a historical phantom i think two days before the war started so that gives you an insight into his views but even he was was too dovish and has now been been sent away um but to come back to to the point he's the head of the russian military historical society and they've certainly played a huge role in in disseminating these narratives um in in the creation of large-scale murals and the creation of, of really hundreds of films and television series so you can see some of the of the murals here that are across um, different cities and um, they've all been created by the russian military historical society but again of course a lot of it's presented as if it's some kind of not necessarily grassroots, but more of a civil society initiative. Even the Russian Military Historical Society itself is presented as if it's sort of civil society. Well, it's not. It's it's this horrible term, a government-organized NGO. Essentially, it's not an NGO. <laughs> it's just a government organization, really, with a bit of funding from some friendly <laughs> oligarchs. Um, but yes. Um, by contrast, um, let's let's move the murals on. Um, by contrast, as we've already heard quite a lot about sort of um, memory in Ukraine, so I don't want to, to repeat, especially since I wouldn't do anywhere near as good a job. Um, I think I would just very quickly say, of course, that there's... Um, I think there's a much less unified position um, on, on the memory of World War II. I think it would be fair to say we see that in sort of in polling. Um, and that since coming to power in 2019, Zelensky actually, may, maybe quite wisely, um, sort of ignored memory politics much more than, than some other uh, Ukrainian politicians had done, sort of staying out of it. But since the war began, um, both at home and abroad, we've seen sort of Zelensky reassert Ukraine's role in defeating Nazism in a way that's almost seems like a bit of a third way between the traditional, what we might say is the traditional or sort of generalizing um, horribly the sort of more nationalist view versus the, um, the more Soviet view of World War II. Um, he's argued that Ukraine wouldn't allow Russia to appropriate the victory over Nazism for its own political purposes. Um, and um, in domestic speeches has, has, has made um, many, many references. And for the sake of brevity, um, I collected and examined sort of 50 of these um, examples of memory diplomacy, but not as used domestically, but as targeted at international audiences um, during the first six months of Russia's war on Ukraine. And I also looked at 50 examples um, from, from Russian officials. So very broadly, these are from the, the President uh, Zelensky, from Putin, um, and from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and um, sort of their official, their official media accounts. And this is the second in a series of, of case studies that hopefully will help me to understand sort of how, how different types of, of governments, different types of states um, use memory diplomacy. Um, so the first thing I did was I looked at memory um, alliances versus memory exports. Um, so within Russia's 50 examples, considerably more memory exports than memory alliances. Opposite was true for Ukraine. Um, 
of these, the Russian memory exports tended um, to focus on World War II, whereas their memory alliances were pretty much purely focused on Western historical colonialism, which is an issue that's come up um, already. Um, by contrast, the, the Ukrainian memory diplomacy actions were, were largely focused on World War II, but that's more out of a reflection of what well, I would hypothesize that's more of a reflection of, of the what the audience uh, wants to hear. Um, so the imbalance in the two countries use of memory exports and alliances of course also impacts their the preferences for format in that memory exports generally less flexible because you're exporting kind of a, a, a ready-made memory product or act or practice or, or story. Um, and it seems reasonable to hypothesize that that would often result in less dynamic campaigns and messaging. So, um, I mean, of course, that's also going to be ref be Im impacted by the different type of, of society. So we have a deeply autocratic society in, with little freedom of expression. In Russia, it's not surprising that they're gonna have a more staid approach. And we see that with the sort of this um, anti-fascist Congress that they organized um, in Moscow with the Minister of Defense himself, who's also on the, advi uh, Sergei Shoigu, who's also on the advisory board of the historical bodies that I mentioned earlier. It just looks really just looks really boring, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> just don't want to be there. By comparison, you know, Ukrainian memory diplomacy has been much more fluid, much more engaging, um, in keeping with their much more engaging communication style. Um, and I think stemming, I've had some interviews, um, uh, and I'm continuing them with uh, some of the um, sort of marketeers who've been working on Ukrainian um, government communications. And it, it stems from the fact that really they are doing this out of, um, first of all, they're professionals. They're doing, they have the freedom and the agency to try different strategies and see what works. Um, they're largely quite young. Um, and of course, they are highly engaged with the matter because there's a war going on. Um, and so we've seen this with the use of sort of memes and 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 uh, focus around the war. I mean, this particular one went very viral um, in the UK. Is comparing the Blitz um, and the bombing of, of Kharkiv in the early days of the war. And so we see this pathos and and humour. And we've seen Zelensky sort of tailor his speeches um, to different um, to different audiences very well in a way that's been discussed. Um, Felix earlier um, in his comments mentioned about the sort of references to the Berlin Wall when it came to. Um, when it came to um, when he when he was speaking to the German Bundestag and, and the idea of um, and also, of course, um, this is essentially an, an attempt to, to position Ukraine as the new Germany, that sort of new boundary, last defense between democracy and, and autocracy. Um, and Zelensky also appealed, of course, to the historical responsibility of, of Germans. Um, in his um, other efforts to build memory alliances, we've seen the Ukrainian president draw on personal stories, um, in particular in, uh, in his discussions um, with Israel. So in a video addressed to the Knesset, um, he, he appealed to the, the Jews of the world to acknowledge what was happening in Ukraine and drew parallels with how Western nations were slow to recognize the Holocaust as a systematic genocide rather than a series of atrocities. And as mentioned earlier, I see the reliance on World War II as more of a reflection of, of um, the importance of that conflict to the address, well, as much as a reflection of the importance of World War II to the addressee nations as it is to, to, to Ukraine. Um, but um, there's, there's quite a few different examples that can be brought. Um, it, although in Washington, he did also draw on, well, uh, online, he did also draw on 9-11 on as well. But memory diplomacy only works if there's some kind of dual a sort of bilateral um, element. And I think we can suggest that that has worked. We see that in ideas such as the reviving of the Lend-Lease Act um, in, and the decision to, to, to carry on using that, that sort of symbolism in, um, in US terms. We've seen Anthony Blinken sort of repeat and, and reproduce Zelensky's narratives. Um, I would say that, of course, uh, the outreach to Israel, that, that did not go down uh, very well at all. Um, and it drew criticism um, from, from a number of, of Israeli lawmakers, although not as much criticism as, as Lavrov got when he, when he claimed that Hitler was Jewish. Um, and so let's very quickly just summarize um, the Russian um, 
uh, memory diplomacy, which, to be honest, has, in terms of the alliances, has been largely typified by um, an, in, an emphasis on um, the anti-colonial narrative. So in visits uh, to a number of African countries between July and August of this year, um, Lavrov was um, at pains to remind all of the people that he met of how the West colonized Africa for its own benefit, which is, of course, perfectly true. Um, but the Russian government has been adept at using the Soviet um, or what he, uh, the Soviet heritage, sort of rewriting this this history as well a bit, um, by and he's claiming it sort of for Russia to, to build ties with African countries. And again, we do see some resonance. So this is just one quote, but it's it's been sort of symbolic of some of the other responses. Um, the president of Uganda's assertion that whenever there are some issues or problems, or someone asks us to support an anti-Russian position, we answer these people, the Russians, have stood with us for the last 100 years. How can we stand against them? And we see a difference here, of course, in the terms of the of the target audiences. Um, and I would be very interested, actually, in learning um, or hearing. I should probably go and do some research if I'm that interested in it. But um, about the interstate communications and memory diplomacy of, of Ukraine with with Eastern and Central European countries, such as Poland and and and, and other countries. Yeah. Um, but I think it's fair to say that most of Ukraine's um, narratives, they've been more focused on and, and had more resonance in um, Europe and, and North America. And one of the areas that I'm, I'm quite interested in, in looking at, whilst also in absolute terror of overrunning my time after having been quite harsh with some other people, um, one of the areas that I'm quite interested in looking at is um, the extent to which we could see Ukraine maybe adopt more of this anti-colonial narrative. Um, we saw, of course, President Zelensky's famous video um, in front, uh, you know, to the the peoples of the Caucasus and 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 other nations, um, sort of national minorities within within the Russian Federation, sort of rallying them um, to sort of against against fighting um, in the war. And it's delivered, of course, in front of the memorial to, to the Chechen fighter Imam Shamil, who we heard earlier actually um, is not particularly popular in, in Chechnya. So that's that's an interesting element, actually. Um, but um, it, 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 nevertheless, um, it drew on a shared experience of, of sort of, of being colonized by Russia and, and of fights for independence. And I think it'd be very interesting to see the extent to which Ukraine would be able to apply such narratives both to um, peoples within nas national minorities within Russia, but maybe also beyond the, the Caucasus, and again, sort of reclaiming certain elements, certain positive elements of, of, of Soviet history, such as the support, for whatever reason, for, for anti-colonial um, monuments, and not not letting sort of Russia kind of nationalize all of all of that. Um, but that's whether or not they can do that is a question for for, for comms people and. Um, Zelensky clearly has much more talented comms people than, than I, and much more talented advice than I could give, so uh, let me end there. Yes, thank you, uh, Jade, for your presentation on for giving us a lot of materials and also visual impressions uh, about cultural diplomacy and uh, well and also the, the comparisons then to to Russia now it's time for to have to have a commentary and, and this will give us Tomasz Striek he is a historian taught in many universities in Poland and Lublin but in, in Warsaw predominantly and he's right now um, a fellow at a uh, Collegium Civitas in Warsaw, and he's known uh, in particular for his book War After War about the anti Soviet underground movement in Eastern Poland um, in the, well, even in the, in, in the decade after the for Second World War. So, Tomasz, the floor is yours uh, and your comment, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I, you, are, you are hearing me well. Uh, first uh, of all, I'd like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me to this panel as a commentator. Please forgive me for connecting via Zoom. Unfortunately, my current personal obligations make it difficult to come and attend the conference directly. 
we have heard four very interesting speeches on the bodies of memory during the wars Russia waged against, against Ukraine since 1918. Three of them concerned the invasion that started on February 24. I hope the rest of the panelists will forgive me for starting with Jade McGlenn's speech as containing the broadest theoretical framework and then moving on to their speeches. Especially since eventually I will indicate the platform where all the speeches meet. Jade defined memory diplomacy as, I quote, political actors' identification, creation, and development of commonalities of memory for geopolitical purposes and or bilateral relations. She also made a reservation that in contrast to memory wars, which involve different actors contesting their country's historical roles, memory diplomacy involves coalescing and converging the historical narratives around these roles. This con concept could be understood as not adequate to the ongoing conflict if she had not added that the relationship between memory diplomacy and memory wars can be symbiotic. Diplomatic actors' efforts to converge historical narratives can be directed not only to potential allies, but also against mnemonic enemies. So, memory diplomacy can function to create a mnemonic coalition within, within a memory war. In the ongoing conflict, both opponents try to build such coalitions using memory resources, which are at their disposal. Jade compared uh, 50 examples of memory diplomacy on each side during the first six months of the war. Within Russia's examples, memory exports twice outnumbered memory alliances. The opposite was in the case of Ukraine. Within 50 Ukraine examples, memory alliances more than four times outnumbered memory exports. Russian memory exports predominantly focused on World War II and Russia's historical international role, whereas uh, memory alliances were focused on the Western historical colonialism. On the opposite side, in the Ukrainian memory diplomacy, World War II also played the primary role, being represented in 23 examples, almost half of 50. But there were also the other examples which appealed to liberation wars in the Caucasus against Russian and Soviet empires, Russian historical colonialism toward the Siberian peoples, and liberation wars for Ukrainian independence. Generally, this meant that both sides appealed to the same or close to the same events in the history of the Second World War, but they attached fundamentally opposite meanings to these events. Jade's analysis finally convinced me the, uh, of the usefulness of the concept of memory alliances in the study of memory politics in international relations. I believe that, uh, paradoxically, in a time of war, when the fighting sides are forced to directly seek the support of world public opinion, the concept works better than in a period of peace. Earlier, I confess, I was a skeptic on this point. Even I, when I read her and Yelena Duranovich's uh, recent article on the contemporary Russian-Serbian memory alliance relating to the period before February 24, I had the impression that it stated something obvious. Russian-Serbian relations in the sphere of culture, history and memory have been closed for a century and a half. So I was not convinced if there is a need to introduce a new concept to capture such phenomena as the Russians' transfer of the immortal regiment practice to Serbia. But now, <clears throat> we could even say that the concept of memory alliances is dualistic by nature. It doesn't work perfectly if it is not opposed to the memory wars. I think that the Russian invasion on Ukraine gave researchers a unique opportunity to compare hostile acts of memory wars and, on the contrary, friendly building of memory alliances by the states in their policies of memory. Using the concept of memory diplomacy, it is now possible to propose comparative models and identify differences between the policies of memory of democratic and authoritarian states in terms of content, content form and effectiveness. 
so much for comments on the theory. Now, I will turn to the question of the effectiveness of the policy of building memory alliances by Ukraine and Russia. Overall, as Jade showed, Ukraine is winning the clash with Russia in the global north and losing in the global south, especially in Africa. In the south, Ukraine cannot break the Russian liberation narrative referring to the Soviet aid to anti-colonial movements and post-colonial states fighting against the Western colonialism and neo-colonialism. Ukraine doesn't effectively use the image of the USSR as imperial state that colonized and pacified by peripheries in Europe in such ways that they caused human losses even greater than in Western European colonial metropolis in Africa, for example, by using hunger terror to complete collectivization and causing the Great Famine in 1932-33. I wonder why Ukrainian historians and the Ukrainian state have not consistent, consistently adopted the colonial paradigm in the narrative about the country's history neither after 2014 nor after February 24. Even Holodomor in the Ukrainian official historical narrative is set in the perspective of rather Stalinism and totalitarianism that in the long term a Russian colonial context. I am a historian. I agree with many historians' reservations that the Russian-Ukrainian historical relationships didn't meet some criteria of the colonial model derived from British India or French Algeria, such as a clear religious class and civilizational boundary between colonizers and colonized. However, I argue that they met the fundamental criterion of the hierarchy of Russian and cult Ukrainian cultures and the incompleteness of Ukrainian culture in the opinion of the Russians across history, also in the USSR peri period. Moreover, Interpreting Putin's policy towards Ukraine since the Orange Revolution, there should be no doubt that it meets the criteria of neocolonialism. I argue that a narrative about Russian colonialism potentially could have a broader resonance in the global south. So I ask, why have the Ukrainian elites now decided to interpret consistently the country's history as that of an object of the Russian colonialism? Why they still stick to the narrative according to which it was not, not much different from the history of the nation states in Europe and differed from them only in the fact that multi, multiple occupations stopped the nation building process that prevented the creation of an independent state until 1991. Moving on to Nadia's speech. I think that her analysis just confirms the colonial character of the Russian-Ukrainian relations in the USSR. Her argument that in Ukrainian SSR since the 50s, about 80% of all, all registered monuments were monuments of the graves of Soviet army soldiers, partisans, and other Soviet victims of fascism, without indicating who of them was Ukraine, also fits to this way of interpretation. Moreover, the conflict in Ukraine's memory policy in 1991-2014 between the national uh, narrative and the post-Soviet and pro-Russian narrative over the so-called Ukrainian dimension of the uh, World War II, which she has presented, can be fully understood only on the basis of the post-colonial paradigm. Although she has not referred to the concept of two Ukraines by Mikhail Rapture, Creole and National Ukraine, and a pioneer of applying this paradigm to the analysis of Ukrainian identity and politics, her interpretation in many ways resembled his way of argumentation. For example, when arguing that during the presidents of Kravchuk and Kuchma, most of the representatives of the political, cultural, and academic establishment in Ryabchuk terms, representatives of Creole elite, remain supporters of the Soviet historical narrative about Ukraine's history in general, who simply repeated the patterns of Russia's memory policy of the day. Nadia points out four trends in Ukraine's memory policy since uh, 2015. Decommunization, 
decommunization, uh, euro integration, Ukrainization, and actualization. Agreeing with this, I'd like to ask about the current the Russification trial. Is it a tendency of the state's memory policy or a bottom up phenomenon? How to explain contemporary derusification, if not by anti-colonial sentiments and popularity of colonial interpretation of the history of Russian-Ukrainian relations in Ukrainian society now? Tina, in turn, presents the Ukrainian Republic choir tour of Europe and America as an act of cultural diplomacy. In her opinion, this is a kind of proof that the then Ukrainian People's Republic fulfilled the function of a typical sovereign state. Such a function, she argues, has been fulfilled by the contemporary Ukraine only since 2015, when a, when a year after the Euromaidan, a special department dealing with cultural diplomacy was established in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'd like to add that her argument leads to the conclusion that the carol of the bell song, an original product of Ukrainian culture, was during the last century colonially appropriated twice by Russians and by the West. The West, which ascribed her origin to Russian culture, to the degree that the West was ready to admit that it had taken the song from the another culture, it shows the culture of the another, another colonialism and not the original culture, which is also the same as in Russia, treated as not legitimist. Also, Alexander, in his analysis of contemporary Russian propaganda, scratched a picture of state of minds of Russian society as a state of post-colonial denial of responsibility for the history of the Russian and Soviet empire. Returning at the end to the question why have the Ukrainian elites not applied consistently the colonial interpretation in the official narrative of the country's history? Let me raise the case of Ukrainian-Polish relations in the context uh, of uh, President Zelensky's official speeches to parliaments and public opinion. Uh, in Poland, in fact, uh, the only past event mentioned in uh, Zelensky's March 11 speech to the Polish Sejm and Senate was the Smolensk catastrophe in 2010. Also, in the president's speech on the occasion of the feast of the Polish armed forces, uh, August 15, there were no references to historical events. With regard to the past, there was only a general statement that Ukraine and Poland had just reached the greatest agreement in their common history. In other words, since February 24, Ukraine has not carried out active memory policy toward Poland. Let me ask, did President refrain from touching any events from the very rich Ukrainian Polish common history? Also those that symbolize not conflict but cooperation, for fear that any example can cause opposition and criticism on one side or even on both and revive old memory conflicts between them. Perhaps he decided to avoid historical issues because for 600 years until 1945, the Polish-Ukrainian relations were relations of, relations of inequality, which if the colonial interpretation of Ukrainian history were adopted, would be perceived as the Polish colonial exploitation in the western and central parts of the country. In any case, an overt application of the colonial paradigm in Ukraine's memory policy would have bilateral consequences, not only in relation with Russia, but also with Poland. And I should add, official Kiev sees that, in, that the Polish public opinion seems to be not ready to accept such an interpretation. Although, of course, it differs fundamentally from the Russian one in perceiving the Ukraine as a fully legitimized sovereign nation. Perhaps, the Ukraine-Polish relations in the last eight months should inspire us to introduce the third category of police of memory, of police of memory in international relations. Then, in addition to memory wars and memory diplomacy, we would have a more refraining or memory avoiding policy. According to the typology of the actors of the politics of memory by Michael Bernhardt and Jan Kubik, two categories of actors refrain or avoid it. 
prospectivists and abnegators. Analyzing the whole of Zelensky's memory policy since uh, 2019 through February 24, I think, in fact, he is partially a prospective and partially an abnegator, who only by the Russian invasion has been forced to become a warrior. I believe for such an actor it is easier to refrain from the police of memory arts than for actors who are by nature warriors. But looking at the Polish side, we can easily see such actors. I am almost sure that for the current Polish authorities, refraining from or avoiding of historical matters in relation to Ukraine in the last eight months has been only temporary. It is likely then they will not abandon the raising of the so-called Volinian slaughter question in relations from, with Kyiv. In Poland, the memory of so-called genocide on Krasnodarnie, committed by the Ukrainian insurgent army in the World War II, still has potential in domestic politics. So I argue that on the factual level, we observe now in Eastern Europe not only memory war and memory diplomacy, diplomacy, but also refraining from acts in the politics of memory in international relations. This is all what I, I have prepared. Yes, I, I, I can say uh, now. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for your broad uh, commentary. Um, is anyone on the panel who felt stimulated or even provoked by the commentary to answer uh, directly? Um, I don't. I don't have anything to, to answer. But I just wanted. Um, I just wanted to, to to thank Tomasz for his comments and also to particularly towards the end. Um, well, his comments on on the theoretical application I found very useful, and also I really like this idea of, of memory refraining um, and as a sort of the the missing the missing part of piece of the of the puzzle. I thought it was very interesting, um, and I wanted to thank him for for answering the question of. Um, how uh, Zelensky um, has has used memory diplomacy um, in relation to Poland, in the sense that, of course, he hasn't. But thank you. I also uh, wanted to thank uh, thank you for commentary, and I want to say that I, I agree with uh, commentary with uh, with that uh, uh, Ukrainian history have to be analyzed in the colonization processes. And uh, I think this, uh, and uh, Tomasz asked about the Russification, which are uh, started more, more actively after uh, uh, February 24. Yes, but this uh, process of the Russification uh, started uh, much earlier. And I, uh, I think it, it was started when uh, law about media uh, and law about Ukrainian language was uh, adopted in uh, Parliament, uh, where um, our, our cultural space uh, was uh, more um, was more uh, open for Ukrainian cultural product and uh, Ukrainian uh, literature, Ukrainian language, and Ukrainian films, and uh, uh, some show business programs uh, uh, received much uh, much more uh, way to uh, to be presented in cultural space in Ukraine. And now, of course, after the new stage of war, this process uh, more um, more actualized, and uh, uh, so many people are ready to uh, this tendency for uh, derusification, and uh, it uh, it's. Uh, Irony is that uh, so many people, which earlier uh, was uh, Russian speakers and uh, was oriented on uh, uh, great Russian literature and uh, for uh, uh, professional uh, contacts with Russian, now after the, this uh, stage of war, they are uh, all, they are almost. Uh, uh, 
uh, they are ready to uh, abandon these practices because it's it's a very uh, hard emotional experience for uh, for many people which are was uh, very uh, oriented uh, to the Russian culture. Yes, I also want to thank uh, for the comments, and I also want to agree with this, uh, with the importance of uh, colonial decolonization context for Ukrainian studies, and also for me it's a really significant uh, conception. I um, differentiate two type, uh, two models of cultural diplomacy, and actually the model of Ukrainian Democratic Republic cultural diplomacy is the model of decolonization cultural diplomacy. There are colonial cultural diplomacy, and we're talking about Ukraine 100 years ago, and even now, of course, this is another kind of model, not imperialistic, not colonial, but decolonization kind of model of cultural diplomacy. So I agreed with this, uh, with this context. Thank you. Yeah, Alexander? Recording the mic. Thank you very much. I was going to say something on these two, two topics like about colonialism. I think the, the scholars that study, that are deep into the colonial studies, they just don't like us. They, you know, there have been like a couple of conferences going on about, you know, colonialism and uh, whatnot. But I, I have known nobody who, uh, you know, from the from the Ukrainians, uh, nobody would go there and uh, none would be invited depicting a Ukrainian case. So I think there is something about us that they don't like. <laughs> and, and second, concerning Zelensky and his uh, policy of uh, memory, etc., I think in this context we should not uh, forget who Zelensky was and maybe still is. Uh, he's been known for being an overt, uh, very pro-Russian, so to say, even pro-Putin's uh, personality. He returned to Ukraine, I think, in 2005, and they say he's done so just uh, to make a mockery out of the Orange Revolution and of, of Yushchenko, and that's what he did for years. And his show, his show on, on the TV, also co-financed by the Russian state, was all about making mockery about Ukrainian culture, language, etc., and people, especially those from Western Ukraine. Uh, you know, they would always be depicted as you know backward peasants, not speaking properly and uh, funnily dressed. And it went all along for for almost a decade. Uh, and it's just recently, just recently that he sort of there was this <laughs> paradigm change, so to say. But probably maybe looking into uh, personal motivations, maybe something of a, uh, uh, he probably, Zelensky, Zelensky probably understood this assault on Ukraine as something as, as a personal challenge, as a, as, a, as a front, so to say. And uh, so now he is very much pro-Ukrainian and I do support his speeches. Some of them are even saved and try to study and read. But uh, again, his whole, whole story all along has been about Russia, pro-Russianness, small Ukrainianness, so to say. And uh, so that's what we should know, I think, too. Thank you. So now it's time <laughs> to, to have questions. Um, I see, well, two, three, four, maybe in the line with Lin first, and then, well, you're on the back, and... Um, <laughs> just it's a suggestion to Jade and others, perhaps. I mean, the, I have been always puzzled to see how these Russian colonialists regard themselves as victims by the Western colonialism in their mm -hmm. propaganda and discourses, but it gives, gives me a deja vu. Uh, the a Japanese empire stance in 1932, when they withdrew their membership from League of Nations, they protested against Western imperialist intervention to intervene against Japanese occupation of Manchuria. 
Even the Machoka, the Japanese ambassador at the time, in his statement address to League of Nations, he described Japan as a crucified nation. It's a metaphor by Adam Mitzkevich, right? They, how on earth can this empire and colonialist power describe itself as a crucified nation? I think that the same thing can be found in today's Russia, but also Ottoman Turkey, Ottoman Empire in the, in the, you know, at the sort of genocide of Armenia. They regard themselves as also victims by the Western imperialism. So how can we categorize of these different, these interesting, intriguing, paradoxical remarks by the second class colonialists on themselves? So some guys, I think that it was one of Koposov or some, some specialist on Ottoman Turkey, she suggested uh, the term of subaltern empire. It was an empire, but subaltern empire, which has been always disregarded by the first tier of colonialists in the West. So on the one hand, they were colonized, they felt they are being colonized by the first tier of empires, but on the other hand, they were colonizers. So this sort of discrepancy or paradoxes, ironies, I think that from the viewpoint of a subaltern empire, we can understand this uh, country. I think even the, the Second, Second Republic of Poland, especially in their attitude towards the minorities in Chris or uh, Ukraine or Lithuania. I think even, I'm, I've been thinking, oh, I can apply the, the concept of subaltern empire even to the history of the Second Republic of Poland from the post-colonial perspectives. <coughs> so this is just suggestion and comment. Yes, so th thank you for the great talk, Hans Kutbro from Ilya State University. I have a question that, that maybe any of you might want to take or maybe not. Uh, it relates directly to the question of memory and uh, uh, a word or a place or a site of memory that I, I did not hear you mention, which was Babin Yar. And I wanted to ask, just because you looked at the larger arc uh, of the interaction between Russia and Ukraine, and of course, Babin Yar receives a lot of coverage in the last few years, um, less so, it was mentioned briefly, of course, in the reports when some missile also hit close to it. But to what extent do you think, does it foreshadow what eventually happened? A kind of a, a denial of Ukrainian agency, a view that Russia or Russian money or uh, kind of needed to come in to actually sort out the, the memorialization that Ukraine needed to do. And then at the same time, and I say this as an outsider, specifically not knowing the Ukrainian context, but I read with interest the letters that a number of Ukrainians had written in response, and that almost the mobilization of civil society, you could almost say an appropriation and assertion of responsibility and stated in response to what had happened, in response to what was seen as already kind of a transgressive uh, attempt to, to, to meddle with Ukrainian memory sites. So again, maybe some of you, it resonates for, with some of the work that you've done. And thanks again for your great talks. Answer first, and then we take a second round. Um, there's a question. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll answer the the first question. I, I probably, I don't know if there's enough time left in the week for us to discuss the issues around Baviyar, but um, I'll I'll leave them to to um, to others um, to answer. I mean, in terms of the idea of sort of Russia as as colonized, yes, you do. I was actually searching for a quote whilst you were speaking because there's a quote from a professor M. Gimor and a, and a former intelligence officer, um, Andrei Bezrukin, who said, for us, this is in essence, he's talking about the, the, the war since February 24th. Uh, for us, this is in essence, a liberating special operation against the US and Britain for independence. 
It is anti-colonial, which is amazing because I think Russia must be one of about four countries that doesn't celebrate its independence from Britain. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, so um, yeah, I think um, you're right though. There's, there's, as well, you have this colonial exceptionalism where they sort of refuse to accept that their colonialism was colonialism and you see in, in different countries, um, including Turkey, which, which you brought up. I think there's been actually quite a lot of really interesting work on on Russian, um, on the sort of the the post-Soviet space as a colonial space, I really like um, David Kearney Moore's work on this. He's described the former societies of the USSR as extraordinarily post-colonial, and he's a traditional post-colonial. Like he's a he's not a Russianist. He's or a student, an area studies person. He's he's a sort of post-colonialist, if that's if that's a term. Um, <coughs> sorry. So <laughs> I think there has been a lot of really good work done on this. I think it's just not, I think it's kind of maybe been siloed. Um, I know like Ab Imperio is one journal that's, that's really done some, some excellent work, but I think it needs to be more in the public space. And I think that's where we're finding sort of resistance, which in its own way, I sometimes find quite um, colonial in the sense of, well, no, because this is our understanding of what colonial means and actually there's no space for your experience of colonialism within it. But uh, maybe since I'm British, I, I should probably shut up on that one. Okay. Thank you. I just want to uh, shortly uh, come, uh, answer about the uh, memorial in Babin Yar. Um, in my opinion, uh, this uh, um, uh, this uh, discussion, these debates about the memorialization of Babin Yar, uh, also uh, have to be analyzed in the uh, decolonization uh, context, because uh, we have two uh, conception. One is uh, so-called state, uh, which are uh, was prepared by Ukrainian historians from different institutions, from Academy of Science, uh, Institute of History, Institute of Political Science, and uh, some of uh, organization of civil society uh, were, were in this uh, process of preparation of, of, of this concept. And uh, another one, it's so-called Russian uh, con conception, which were prepared by um, uh, also by academicians, uh, Ukrainians, uh, uh, foreigners, and uh, um, some Russians, uh, oligarchs, uh, were in this concept. Uh, they are uh, f financed this uh, concept. And uh, Ukrainian historians uh, uh, pointed out that uh, we are in Ukraine have to uh, analyze this uh, place of uh, commemoration. We have to prepare a concept, and we have to uh, we have to uh, be ready to uh, take uh, responsibility for this process of memorialization and uh, properly commemoration and uh, mm, part of uh, Russian so-called Russian concept they are don't uh, they don't listen to uh, voices of uh, so many Ukrainian historians and uh, civil society organizations so I think it's uh, it and its process it's not over yet and uh, now it's we have some um, it's it's a break uh, because of uh, new stage of war and uh, I think that um, how debate uh, will start it when uh, war will uh, be over because it's very painful and very uh, very responsible uh, place uh, and and process Maybe. so um, I've seen two other questions or even three <laughs> Thank you so much. It was very interesting to listen to your speech. Uh, I would like to say that um, researching Russia propaganda may involve some emotion, some psychological distress, so I really appreciate your work. And maybe a question to uh, Mr. Svetlov. Uh, like, did you maybe research also a kind of influence that the Russian propaganda had on Western countries, like kind of 
I was so surprised to see that the um, rhetoric that far left parties and far, li uh, far right and far left used, it was similar and it was the case that it had like such a huge Russian uh, influence. And I would like to ask if you research like how they influence, like is it really monetary, is it kind of material or maybe also somehow ideological, like how did it impact them? Uh, because it was really shocking for me, and it actually revealed like how many, how much rhetoric was pro-Russian um, during the war, but also before. And what's more, actually, before it was anti-vaccine, and then it turned somehow un to be uh, anti-Ukrainian, and it was like so shocking for me. Like, how did it work? So it occurred that this propaganda also anti-vaccine came actually from Russia. And the other question I just wanted to ask uh, to maybe um, Ms. Perosenko, could you uh, just uh, um, explain me uh, these Petlura uh, events, like how are they perceived in Ukraine? Because I think it's not well known fact about uh, this w that there was an agreement between Poland and Ukraine back then, and uh, that do you perceive it as a like? Polish stands after that as a treasure, and how how is it like perceived now? I mean, back then there were like two uh, camps, like one was federationist and one was nationalist, and unfortunately this nationalist won. But I think that it's also like interesting topic to explore between our like relations. Thank you so much. There was a question here, and um, front and. Thank you. Um, just a question for Jay. Did you see any difference when there are direct clashes between the memory narratives? For example, when getting back to my presentation yesterday, in international forums where both Russia and Ukraine are participating, and maybe uh, one thing to look at, and I think it happens quite a lot, that um, what happens in international forums like the UN, like other forums, when either Russia or Ukraine speaks? So and that, by that, maybe you can see the reception. Uh, just an interesting aspect to look at. Thank you. And one further question from, uh, yeah, just. Thanks very much for the, um, the great presentation. So again, David Wood from Seton Hall University. Um, I've got two, uh, so I'm being a bit abuses of, of time here. Um, Jade, I really like this. I, of distinguishing between um, memory wars and memory diplomacy. And for me, I'm thinking about the practical application of that, because if you think about diplomacy generally, it, it sh it's more effective when it has a stronger strategy behind it, when there's strategic intent. So what can application of this idea help us to, to analyze and distinguish and distill the strat strategies that countries are developing. I think that's very interesting because what was very much missing from your chart was, for example, the positioning towards the Middle East and North Africa. And if you look at the Middle East, it's critical for, for Ukraine and for Russia in terms of global stability flowing from the fuel that's provided by the Middle East and also the potential for crises in the Middle East because of um, food imports and drops that that would seem to be a key strategic priority. Why isn't it there? That was interesting for me. And then linked to that is this, I think it'd be really useful to compare your model with um, the application of integrative complexity towards signaling in international relations. You know, this idea that when, when, when states' representatives start to signal in less complex terms, we're closer towards outbreaks of violence. So is it the, the, similarly the case if we see more memory diplomacy, are we getting closer to outbreaks of violence? I think that would be really interesting as well. And then secondly for, for Tina, the, the example was so powerful. I'd love to, give, to have you give the, the, the talk at my school as well, if that's, that would be possible, it'd be wonderful. And again, I really like this idea of cultural diplomacy and its application. And, but what you seem to chart was an initiative that was started by a state and then continued by people and communities in a way, even though it was a small group of the, of the singers. I, I'd like to get a sense from you around how this, this application can distinguish between forms of diplo diplomacy that are top-down and state-directed and those which might be 
generating from peoples and communities without much um, direction from the state. That would be really interesting. Thank you. Uh, so it's me starting. Uh, concerning your question about uh, the West and the role of the West in, uh, in the context of Putin's war, you, you, you see, over 100 years ago, uh, a term has been coined by Lenin, I think he was the first to use it, I think, maybe not. Uh, he mentioned useful idiots. And uh, that's what has just pop, pop, popped up in my mind when, when listening to your to your question and thinking about the topic. Uh, and in this context, we, you know, the current political science to, scientists in, the, in Ukraine not only mention uh, Schroeder, which is, um, you know, very emblematic and Schroederization of, of, of European politics, but also some uh, harmless uh, at face value politicians like Macron, who he's often compared to Poodle, who runs around, uh, you know, voicing uh, yet another Putin's uh, agenda could also be attributed to the pool of um, so-called useful idiots. But again, don't cite me. Uh, if the support for Russia is ideological, there are only, to, only three countries in the world which, which, uh, which, which agree to stain themselves with the, with the, with the emblem of, of Russia at the moment. This, this is Belarus and, uh, and Syria. It's not even North Korea and not even Eritrea, though they sometimes, sometimes vote uh, at the United Nations for, for, for Russia. Uh, to give you another example in terms of, you know, whether it's ideology that, uh, you know, that, that is shared, you know, you know, somebody, you know, from the West with an ideology sort of supporting and resonating with Putin or not. I, I remember at the height of the of the Russian-Ukrainian war in uh, 2015, uh, when uh, you know everybody would in Russia would depict Ukraine as being a fascist state. Uh, in St. Petersburg, there was a conference, uh, a gathering of extreme right political parties, and that was also very uh, symptomatic of um, of the things which were going on and still continue to go on in in, in Russia. And so obviously, from a psychological point of view, maybe it's something very, um, you know, attractive, um, you, you know, uh, to be uh, depicted as a, and see oneself as as, a, as belonging to the global, to the global absolute evil. Uh, you know, there are there are countries, parties, people which get excited when they when they have a, get a, an opportunity. Uh, me myself, I, I spent some time in, in in Germany just to give you another example about you know being friendly with Russia some time in Germany it always you know puzzled me the things that uh, the, you know I could partly understand the the, the former GDR, GDR population uh, who could sort of uh, you know which experienced Soviet Union from afar and then under the disguise of very friendly and attractive uh, slogans like you know uh, how do you call it Miru Mir peace to the world and uh, eternal friendization with Soviet people, you know, and all that. And also at that time, the grass was greener, of course, and the, the sky was, uh, was bluer, so I could understand them. Uh, it's also sort of, you know, if you think about it in terms of Stockholm Syndrome, could also be a good explanation. Uh, but the rest of the German society, I could never understand them. I think on the logical level, the logical fallacy was that they somehow thought that Gorbachev gave them something for free. And that was, you know, the GDR. But they probably miscalculated or misunderstood his, 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 uh, his position. He, he just gave, gave away back to Germany something that he, who, he could no longer possess. And he did not really give it away. He, he sold it for, for Teures Geld, how do you call it, for lots of money. So maybe if Germans would see it in this term, they would lose the, the last, how do you call it, the last stance on, you know, feeling somehow obliged uh, to, to Russia. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, just, I will just answer um, David's questions very quickly. So um, in terms of strategic intent, I agree it's an interesting area. I think it's probably 
uh, we can maybe discuss it later, but I think it's probably too long an answer for, for, for now. Um, in terms of the Middle East, North Africa, um, if I just fo focus on the, well, I, I guess it is the whole MENA region, but um, of course there's been a lot um, of diplomacy going on there, but even traditionally in the first kind of research that I did looking into memory diplomacy, sort of, and this was, I've been working on it for a while even, or it's sort of been gestating for a while, um, <coughs> They, Russia doesn't really practice memory diplomacy with that region. It actually practices religious diplomacy instead, where it positions itself as sort of more somebody who has sort of like duchovnost, like a sort of spirituality, um, unlike the, the West, which is just like having one long like gay parade all of the time, you know. Um, so that's, that's how it's the sense of we respect the um, feelings of believers. Um, we are sort of a spiritual people, a people who care about religious um, religious believers. So that's more the approach that they use. So I wasn't that surprised to find a lack of memory diplomacy for those reasons. And then in terms of signaling, could memory diplomacy kind of, as it gets becomes more stark? I think you, that's definitely correct, but I don't think it would be memory diplomacy. I think it's more the historical narratives and analogies. And I think one thing that in particular I fought back a lot too is why I... Uh, is the importance of the July 2021 essay on the hist that Putin wrote on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And I remember at that whole time, and, and even actually at the, uh, we met, David and I met at a, a round table in London and I discussed it with a Ukrainian lady who was speaking there. She was like, but who is it for? And I was like, well, well, it's not for the West because it's too esoteric. It's, it's not for Russians because if they want that narrative, they could have it in more entertaining ways. So I was like, it must be for Ukrainians. I was like, but he can't, he just can't be, that's insane. There's no way he could think that would appeal to Ukrainians. He, he would be so, his vision of Ukrainian society would be so so flawed. And But it always bothered me because I couldn't kind of think, and, and I think it was aimed at, at Ukrainians. And, and obviously his vision of, of Ukrainian society was that flawed. Thank you for your questions. Um, uh, so I want to answer, um, I want to say I'm not so, it's not my topic, Petlura and Pilsudski alias, but I have, I want to say that uh, for the history of this uh, cultural diplomacy of this uh, tour, of, of this choir, uh, the role of Poland was very positive because uh, a lot of Ukrainian army was allowed to stay in Poland and actually at that camps uh, Alexander Koshitz, uh, conductor of this choir, took uh, soldiers from Ukrainian armies uh, as the singers for an American tour and for these soldiers, for these singers it was uh, the chance to survive uh, and to go to the west and to continue to promote Ukrainian, Ukrainian idea. So just a little, this case, uh, and even um, Petlura asked uh, this choir to come to Poland and to make a concerts. And they didn't know about, uh, the, about the, the agreement. They had concert in, in uh, uh, 19th of October, 1920. And uh, the day before the agreement was between uh, Poland and Soviet Russia. But despite on this, uh, Petlura asked the choir to make these concerts because he really wanted to, to, to have this to have this uh, union with, with Poland and to, he wanted to show Ukrainian culture to, to different parties, uh, political uh, parties of, of, uh, the Poland, of Poland and federative and nationalistic also. Nationalistic uh, press uh, in Warsaw was not very optimistic about that concerts. <laughs> Um, but most of uh, these press reviews was very uh, positive and they really uh, liked this concert and the idea of Ukrainian independence also because of this uh, tour of this concert, so it was good. Uh, and uh, concerning this uh, also very interesting context, uh, as you mentioned, about uh, state cultural diplomacy and then civic cultural diplomacy, it is also very interesting because, uh, well, these thinkers, uh, and uh, uh, they were just citizens of Ukrainian uh, Republic, 
and then then became they became a political uh, a servant public servant uh, even a diplomat diplomats musical uh, diplomats um, also, uh, Alexander Kosic was a public service also. He was the first uh, head of um, uh, musician uh, department of the Ministry of, uh, of Arts of Ukraine. So he, he was in public service also. But this is very interesting because when they go, when they went to America, uh, for the first uh, two years, they uh, was founded founded by Ukrainian government, financed by Ukrainian government. But when they uh, went to America, I didn't mention this because of lack of time. Uh, this Ukrainian choir, like today's Ukrainian artist, sent money to Simon Petlura, and I found the letter of Simon Petlura when uh, where he. Uh, thanks uh, to Alexander Koshitz for sending him one hundred and sixty dollars. <laughs> Actually, uh, and he used this uh, money for Ukrainian army because he really uh, hoped to uh, mm -hmm. to yes to bring Ukraine independence. <laughs> so it is very interesting uh, because they were on public service and then even. Uh, when they lost their country and they were not uh, in public service, they continued to, to, to make uh, this uh, diplomatic mission and to serve to, to the idea of the independent state Ukrainian uh, Republic. Thank you. Yes, this was a good final remarks by you, Tina. Well, if we understand uh, art and culture, it's sometimes undomestic, but obviously somehow also a driving force for change and for, well, to transfer a certain message to other people. So thank you, you, Tina, Nadia, Alexander, uh, Jade, and Tomasz online, thank for your contributions. And now if there are not any comments from the organizers, then I wish you a nice evening in Warsaw, and then we see us again tomorrow at 9.30 for the last day of the conference. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.